Um, great to be here. And uh, obviously, it would be nice if we could have all convened together. But, you know, in the future, we will. There is hope on the horizon, I think. Um, but let me go ahead and share my slides. And I'll dive right into this. So um, no pressure, I guess, on the last presentation of the event. <laughs> um, unfortunately, because of the tyranny of time zones, I wasn't able to attend most of the event, but I could see from the content of the program that I missed a lot of great talks. So um, hopefully I can live up to that here. But um, basically what I want to dive into is talk about this, this real challenge that a lot of these large companies deal with. And I think a lot of this has been documented to a certain degree in uh, the media. Every once in a while, you'll see a story in some of the major you know, media outlets about like Google changed their maps or you know, Microsoft did this to appease whatever government. And you know, we, we hear those little tidbits now and then. But I think we on the cartographic side realize that this is kind of a course of doing business. Um, I just wanted to start with this early example, which I think all of us are familiar with. Um, and I wanted to start with this because it has direct relevance to this topic, as well as the fact that I'm actually from California. I was born and raised in Southern California. And so I have a particularly affinity uh, for this particular issue. So um, I'm not going to belabor this very much for the sake of time, but I think all of us realize that for a very long time, California was shown as an island on quite a few maps. But the reality is that, you know, going all the way back into history, and I'm not, I'm going to basically just display this so you can read it, because I'm not going to go through and read everything here. The basic gist of this is that we knew almost a hundred years before uh, California showed up as an island on the first map in 1622, a Dutch map, which displayed it as an island. We knew almost a hundred years in advance based on the various Spanish expeditions that it was not an island. We knew that Baja was a peninsula. Um, it was verified um, a few times actually before, but um, the key turning point though was that when the Friar Recension uh, decided that it was more uh, advantageous to the Spanish claims on the West Coast to counter the uh, Nova Albion claims that Drake had, had put forth uh, for the sake of British interests. Um, so he felt that the it was better for California to be shown as an island um, because it helped reinforce the claims based on the, the whole uh, legal regime at the time. So, and so therefore, you know, in 1602, that decision was made. And then 20 years later, we get the first map showing California as an island. And then that perpetuated for over 200 years. The map you're seeing here is this uh, image from Japan from 1850, which was the last known map showing California as an island, even though we knew you know, 300 years earlier that it was not. It, 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 the, the fact that the King of Spain had to declare in the mid 18th century that California is not an island in a lot of ways that kind of reminds me of some of the things that happen today on social media where people have to shout like, you know, this issue is, is it's real or it's not real or please stop listening to the fake news or whatever it might be. So my point is, we've been dealing with this kind of misinformation through cartography for pretty much ever since cartography existed. So, um, of course, there's the beautiful satellite image of how it actually looks. So um, I threw this in really quick just to give you an idea where I'm coming from. I, uh, the, given the Carson's talk just a couple of talks ago, this was from my master's thesis in 1991, because being the, the tech geek that I am, I was very uh, uh, keen on doing a, a topic around using VR, virtual reality, for cartography way back when, but that's when VR was very nascent, didn't work very well, um, but this is some of the ideas that I was thinking about way back when. But my basic history is that I went from graduate school because just by pure proximity, doing my work at the University of Washington here in Seattle, um, I ended up at Microsoft initially just to consult um, for a brief time on Encarta Encyclopedia and help them make the original maps for Encarta Encyclopedia way back when. But that could just kind of turn into eventually a 13 year career because they kept asking me to do additional work. And as a starving graduate, student, I felt, well, the money's good and the, the work is fascinating. So um, it, it's hard to find where I can do something where I'm doing applied geography in a way that has so much exposure in such a short time frame. Um, 
I ended up creating a team at Microsoft called Geopolitical Strategy because what I noticed is that the company was very ill-equipped for dealing with these issues. They had no idea how to react when they're getting China and Taiwan yelling at them about the depiction of Taiwan or you know, Korea and Japan talking about the East Sea or Sea of Japan. And so basically I created this team to help coordinate this knowledge and not just about cartographic issues, but that's how it started because those were original, the, the original catalyst for this conversation that expanded to many other forms of representation um, of people and you know flag usage, color usage, everything. Um, and then after I left Microsoft in 2005, my first major client was Google. And so I helped Google create their geopolitical team and deal with a lot of the, the geopolitical sensitivities in Google Earth and Maps. And, um, but, um, and so since that time, I've advised a lot of different companies on these issues, um, which again, has is a, the commonality between all of them is that most all of them are very ill equipped to understand um, what's going on in terms of how they do cartographic depiction and how sensitive that can be. And I have found in my work in the tech sector for all these years that geographers and cartographers, we are really well suited for this work because, because we spend all of our time deconstructing the real world. And so for me, when I'm talking about cart cartography, oftentimes I'm talking about it to these non-cartographers as a world building exercise or world rebuilding, because that's essentially what it is. And so that language dovetails very nicely, like in say a lot of my work that's in the video game sector, that's all they do is world building. And a lot of the world building that they do is oftentimes based on, without them even realizing it, on cartographic and geographic principles. So I oftentimes, for example, push to them the GIS model to think about their world in layers and to think about that kind of um, a framework because it often helps them because they just don't have that framework. They're just kind of building all this stuff on sort of a random basis. So I try and present to them even an image like this helps them solidify, okay, oh, I don't need to add all of these things. I can just add pieces as needed to build the world that we need for a particular game's narrative. Um, so basically a lot of my career has been spent exploring this interaction between what is real, basically out there, the ground truth and how we represent it and then how it's perceived by the end user, um, whoever that might be. And you know, speaking of real, no, that is not Los Angeles. That is actually a fictional uh, Los Santos from the game Grand Theft Auto V. Uh, they just did an incredibly good rendering uh, of their city. Um, so going back a bit, just some of the issues, just to give you an example of the issues that I've had to deal with, like this is the map I created for Encarta way, way back when, before we were even doing vector-based maps. Um, so for the CD-ROM Encarta Encyclopedia, we had this map of Turkey, um, which because of the label Kurdistan on the map, this map got the uh, general manager of the Microsoft Turkey office thrown into jail. And basically the government said, unless you take Kurdistan off the map, we are not releasing him from prison. And so the decision was made to remove the label from the map, but we did not remove the entry from the encyclopedia because it's a very legitimate issue and was something we wanted to highlight. But this is, at least for me, this was one of the early uh, issues that I encountered working at Microsoft where, you know, we're realizing, you know, the, the, the sensitivity that was going on around these issues and the, the level to which a government was willing to go um, to enforce that kind of change. Um, you know, Windows 95 was banned in India because we used to highlight the, the time zones in Windows so that you select your time zone and you would see that longitudinal slice um, appear in a highlight. Well, be because India is a half hour time zone, it had the opportunity to highlight the boundary between, you know, and, and highlight the Kashmir issue in India. And so the government banned Windows 95 over those few red pixels that were missing, um, which they felt, you know, needed to show their claim on Kashmir. And so this was the issue that basically stopped us from highlighting time zones ever again. And it's been that way ever since. And, you know, even simple things like this, where we just had these really uh, low resolution uh, maps of the world. This is actually a subset of the world map that was included in office way back when. Um, but we had the, the uh, Ecuadorian government petition us to include the dispute, you know, the Cordillera del Condor uh, dispute that was disputed at that time. Um, so we had to go in and add that little appendix to the data, even though it was a bit out of the resolution range, if you look at the rest of the resolution of the map. But they demanded that that little uh, piece be added because, again, they were right in the middle of this dispute back in the 90s. 
And this goes on and on and on in Cardinal World Atlas. I mean, for example, me being in this position of being um, this geopolitical strategist, which was my title at Microsoft, I would regularly have the consulate representatives from both Korea and Japan visit my office physically once a year to petition me on why the Sea of Japan or the EC is the proper name to use for this feature. And they would give me these really glossy, beautiful brochures that look like something you'd get when you're trying to buy property somewhere and they would illustrate, you know, hey, this is the historical reasons why Sea Japan is the only proper name to use. And of course, Korea had their whole plethora of content that would counter that argument. What was interesting is that Korea has been doing this a lot longer, trying to petition because they have a, a, a very aggressive approach to their cartography, including the Dokdo Takashima issue and all the other disputes in their area. Japan caught up later when they found out that Korea was doing this and they were petitioning petitioning cartographic publishers, including Microsoft, that's when Japan kind of got into the game and started doing it as well. So the work I did at Google, basically I helped them lean into the technological approach to do what we call domain tailoring of the maps. And this is one of those things that you'll see in media, you know, news reports every once in a while, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that Crimea is shown as Russian territory in the Russian version of Google Maps. That's the idea because we have laws in different markets, including India, including China, some of these other places where there are very strong, either it's a legal basis or it's a strong basis for, you know, you basically an entry requirement, like showing Western Sahara as part of Morocco for that particular market. And so Google initially being um, the idealistic tech company it was back in the mid 2000s, when I first was brought into this issue, they said to me that showing, you know, all these disputed areas, they said it was a technical problem. It was not a geopolitical problem. In other words, they said they were convinced they can make one map that's gonna work for the entire world. And I just used Kashmir as one example. I said, well, with Kashmir alone, you instantly have four versions, China, Pakistan, India, and then this global version showing you know, the more disputed depiction you see on the left there. And that kind of threw them. They're like, well, but can't we show? No, you can't. Well, maybe if we, no, you can't. That's not gonna work because just India and China alone are you know, uh, polar opposites of their depiction. So that's where I encourage them to lean into their ability as a technological company to actually use their technology to do this domain tailoring to actually, you know, go down that path. And they have become very, very successful at that. They do it very, very well, and they tend to react very quickly. So even with the Crimea issue, which got them some attention, um, you know, if you go to the non-Russian version of it, um, you know, you have to zoom in quite close, but you can see that there is a disputed boundary where the Crimean Peninsula connects to mainland Ukraine. So it is shown as disputed, it's just not shown as disputed in the Russian version. Um, and here's just another example. This is what you would see in the China domain of Google Maps. And then if you watch closely, um, I think we're all familiar with this anyway, but then you can see this is what it looks like in the India domain. And this is, a again, a pre, it has become a pretty common practice um, over the years. And these issues are not new to us, like I said. I mean, we see these stories pop up quite a bit. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, this is one of those things I have to track quite closely for some of the clients that I work with, you know, and so it, it's, none of this is really surprising. It just makes for good news stories because it reminds people that, you know, cartography is still a thing, um, even though we see studies that show that uh, younger generations can't even read a map or they can't even use a paper map, but that's a whole discussion for another time that's kind of depressing. Um, but the interesting thing is that this is also spilling over into creative media as well. It's not just an issue of cartography and what we use on our phones and on our computers. It's also things that show up in movies or show up in video games. So for example, this movie Abominable, you can see that map that appeared in the movie in the background is the Chinese depiction of the territory showing the, the, you know, the nine dash line covering the South China Sea in, in Taiwan. Now, for this reason, and this map appears very quickly in the movie, it's just like one second where the camera's panning past the map. So the, you know, the other disputants to this issue, Philippines, Malaysia, and Vietnam, they all requested that this one little shot in the film be removed. And they said, then we'll release the film in our market because, but we just don't want to see this particular map. 
Well, the studio, DreamWorks, major studio, they said, no, they're not going to remove this. And that was kind of shocking because normally they would make that kind of change to accommodate the local, you know, expectation. And so then they could, you know, produce all kinds of additional revenue in these markets. But for this movie, they decided not to. And I think a big part of that is because this movie was co-produced by a Chinese animation studio and they resisted having even removal of this one second shot of this map. And so for that reason, this is why this movie did not release in those three markets over this issue. Um, and this is becoming more and more common. And of course, you know, I, I don't really need to go into how complicated this issue really is. Um, and we're seeing the spillover into things like, you know, we get backlash on t-shirts because the Gap accident, accidentally left off Taiwan from their map of China. So then it becomes like this huge conflagration and a, you know, a, a dispute between the company and China. And of course, because they have a lot of stores in China, you know, they will bend over backwards to basically fix it and do whatever the government tells them to do. Um, and in video games too, this is obviously an area where I, I spent a lot of my time. We've had quite a few interesting issues happen in games. I mean, this was one that happened a while back in Flight Simulator, where you can see here in the red, what the those are the air traffic control boundaries for the different countries you can see there. And what, what happened is that one of the uh, beacons that goes along the, the Aegean coast on the east side of the Aegean coast, one of those points that is used to interpolate the air traffic control boundaries boundary was missing from the data set. And so what happened in the game is that the air traffic control boundary actually shot out into the Mediterranean um, and it, so it bisected the island of Rhodes. So as you're flying in a eastward direction over the island of Rhodes, all of a sudden you got a notice in the game saying you are now in Turkish airspace while you're still flying over Rhodes. So the Greek government was really not happy about this. And they actually banned the game over it until we fixed it, which we fixed it pretty quickly. Um, but they were really not happy about us ceding control of uh, part of Rhodes to Turkey. And it was, again, it was just one interpolation point that was missing. Uh, other things like this happen quite a bit. Um, this is from the original Age of Empires game. I've worked on all of these titles. Um, we're finishing up Age of Empires 4 at the moment. Um, but this, what happened here is that in, you know, historical, uh, you know, texts and documents tell us that what really happened in the Middle Ages is that Japan, there on the on the right, they invaded the Chozon Empire in red on the Korean Peninsula there, and basically almost took it over. And so the developers, the game developers, decided this would make a really challenging scenario if you're playing as the Chozon Empire being invaded by Japan. Well, when we released this game into the Korean market, we got an instant ban by the Korean government. And so we, as we talked with the Korean Ministry of Information about all this, they basically, we were wondering, so what's the issue? And basically the issue for them is they said, this never happened. We were not invaded like this. And so therefore, in order to release this game into the Korean market, we actually had to kind of step through our own goals, like, sh do we need to release in the Korean market? And like, well, the answer was yes. It's a very strong gaming market. They love this type of RTS, real-time strategy game. And so we felt that we needed to release it. So the only way we could could release it was create a special patch only for Korean players in which now you see that the Chosun Empire is invading Japan. Um, and yes, that is quite a departure from history. So as you might expect on the development team, this created quite a bit of debate about the nature of truth. We were having deep discussions about ethics and all in truth in history and the depiction of history and all these kind of things. I had to remind the team, though, that a few years earlier, when I was working on Encarta Encyclopedia, we had different facts in different versions of the encyclopedia because different governments have different you know, expectations on what those facts are. For example, in the French and Italian versions of the encyclopedia, we had different heights for Mont Blanc because at the time the governments didn't agree on the exact height of the mountain. I think it was off by a few centimeters, um, but we had to have different heights because it is an educational resource and it must comply with the local educational guidelines. Um, and so the facts have to conform to local facts. And so in a way, this was sort of an example of doing a similar thing. Games like this, this is a game called Hearts of Iron, which, which is very much like the board game Risk, if you've played Risk, in which the world is divided into all kinds of pieces. And China banned these games because Tibet and Taiwan were not being shown as 
a whole part of China, even though, as you can see, China is completely divided up into all kinds of territories here, but they were very focused on Taiwan and Tibet as not being, you know, being shown as whole with China. The interesting part about these games, though, is that they take place in World War II, which of course is, you know, that ended four years before the People's Republic of China even came into existence. So they have this content policy in which they basically reinforce their, their what I call the geopolitical imagination that they have into the past before they're technically even their uh, current existence and their current uh, political entity. So what we're really seeing here and what I deal with every day in my work is, is this digital battle for mindshare because constant battle between governments and cultural institutions, different factions online and rogues and all these other people on the internet were trying to push this, what is the narrative? And so that key issue that we're constantly fighting and that I'm helping these companies with is who will you let define the global and local geopolitical narrative? Who gets to decide what the map looks like? What is the gateway for showing it in a certain way? When do you draw the line as a company for not making that change because it may cross a moral or ethical boundary that you as a company might have. And I know it sounds kind of funny to even talk about moral morality and ethics in the terms of a business, even though it should it is a worthy discussion. But back in my day, I, sometimes I would have to debrief Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer directly on why a product was banned in a certain market. And at one point I asked Bill Gates directly, I said, who's the moral compass of Microsoft? Because I need to know, like, when does the company like Microsoft decide, for example, to show Kosovo as a full-blown country or to show Taiwan as a separate sovereign entity um, and not ambiguous? You know, who does, makes those decisions? And I felt that there needed to be some kind of highest level of, of decision making on this. And he laughed at me and said, well, that's your job. And I'm like, well, I don't think I'm paid enough to be the moral compass of Microsoft. But his point was, and it was a good point, is that people like Bill Gates, these visible figures who run these large companies, they can't be the ones being seen as making that decision, even if they have an opinion, because what happens if he's wrong? All of a sudden, the stock drops and people lose confidence in the company and the leadership, et cetera, et cetera. If someone like me gets that decision wrong, they quietly eject me out the airlock and just say, hey, we had somebody who made a mistake and then they replace me and move on. So it's a lot easier basically to get rid of someone like me and expendable. Uh, Bill Gates is not as expendable. So it's an interesting conversation, but it's one that I often tell clients, I confront them with the issue of when, where is your values? You know, Where are you willing to draw the line on making these changes or not? What I've seen in my career working on uh, in the tech sector is this evolution of content versions. So we used to have way back in the early days, a default version where basically this is the version you release without any changes. You don't do localization, you know, language translation. You don't do any culturalization, which is like doing some of these map modifications, like I mentioned. Those days have been over for quite a while, unless it's a creative product. So like someone writes a book and they release the book and that's that's the version. It, may, it might get banned in different countries for different reasons, but usually the author is like, I don't care. That's my book. That's, that's, I'm, that's what I'm putting out there. Um, films and video games tend to not be quite so default anymore because they want to maximize the revenue. So they at least do some version of localization where you still have that default version, which usually means that's the version you created in your local language, you know, in your perspective, and then you do localization. Um, but today, most companies do what I call the globalized version, where they create that version, but then they do a lot of localization. It's, it's not unusual at all for a software product to be localized into 15, 20, 30 languages um, for a lot of different markets, and then also do some level of culturalization as well. So doing some of these uh, locale-specific tweaks that I mentioned, uh, that I illustrated with the maps. Um, but more companies today are actually leaning more towards what I call this culturalized version, where they're spending a lot of time and energy to make a version that feels like it was made locally. Um, and this is even goes to as far as like 
basically what you have to do for a lot of Chinese products, you have to partner with a Chinese company and basically make it in China to make it you know, acceptable. But um, the, there's that level of, of adaptation that is going on now because companies want to not only maximize the revenue by making globalized versions, they actually want people to engage at that emotional visceral level, you know, basically where we're talking about the social media level, they want people to connect on an emotional level with their content and they feel that they have to do more adaptation to that end, which includes cartography as well. So this is basically just an illustration of this. Um, and what it really comes down to is this issue, whether a company or an individual wants to maximize their self-expression, so their creative vision and not really change anything, or they're trying to maximize exposure. And what I have found as a cartographer working in this space is that it's really a big struggle at times because we are committed, you know, in my view, what I kind of joke to my non-cartography friends, what I call the Ptolemaic Oath, which is we are committed to showing ground truth. I want to show ground truth on my map. I want to show what's there. That's my job. But in this tech space, it's like that that has always been my focus. But there's all of these business goals and all these other things and layers and layers, of course, that are on top of that, that dictate a, a departure from that approach. And so that's often a, a, a teachable moment for a lot of people I work with where I have to explain to them what they are actually doing and what the consequences are of making that change to the map. So this war on versioning that is happening right now has been pretty interesting. And I've seen it as a, okay, I've seen this as a phenomenon that is happening very, pretty recently. I mean, especially mo even more vigorously over the last five years or so, um, especially because we're seeing this overreach where before, for example, and I'm, I am going to pick on China because they're an easy one to pick on, before China would accept, for example, the fact that there are maps that show, they don't show the South China Sea claim. They show Taiwan as being separate. They don't show Arunachal Pradesh as Chinese territory. But now we're getting to this point where the Chinese government is being far more aggressive at reaching out to a lot of these large companies and not accepting the fact that there are different versions. So basically what China is doing is they want the default version to be their version, not this other you know, globalized version which shows disputes and everything. They want that global version to be th their version with, you know, showing their guidelines. Otherwise, that's when they start putting economic pressure on companies saying, well, you know what, we're going to close your stores here unless you comply. Or we're like they did with the airlines. They didn't like airlines showing Taiwan as a separate destination. They wanted it as a subset under China when you're, you know, booking your flight. So they put pressure on American, uh, American airline companies, and they bowed to the pressure because China said, "You either do this, or we're going to remove your berths at Chinese airports," which is obviously a huge economic impact. Um, one of the big reasons this is such a concern in the digital space is because of this number, even though this date is a little bit old and it's actually pre-pandemic, which makes it even more alarming because the pandemic. In actually increased screen time for people. But this number, over 12 hours a day spent in front of screens, whether it's television, our phones, laptops, tablets, whatever. But that is a lot of time being spent in the digital world and in the digital space. And this battle over mindshare and around the perception of the world through digital cartography is something that's being fought every single day. And so people, as we know, as we know very well over the last year or two, um, can be very well influenced by what they read in the, or see in the digital spaces. And so that's one of the reasons why this battle um, is just over the simple perception of the world and what the boundaries are and what, the, what sovereignty looks like in different parts of the world um, is being played out in this space because a lot of these governments and other uh, factions know that that's where people are spending their time. So, um, so there you go. I, I think I, I hopefully finished on time, but there. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. That was great. Um, do we have any questions? I see one in the Q&A. Alex asks, do some countries oppose the existence of domain tailored versions? Yes. Yeah, in short, yes. I mean, like I mentioned, China is, is one of them. Um, there's other countries when you get down to it, most of them, they kind of realize that, yes, companies have to do this. Um, it, it's funny because even way back in my Microsoft days, I had a meeting with the Surveyor General of India on one of my trips there. 
because I wanted to talk to him directly about the cashmere issue and the complications we were having with it. And, you know, he told me in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, he said officially, yeah, I, it has to be this way. It's a legal requirement, it's a political issue, et cetera. But then he said, you know what, between you and I, he's like, I know the pain this causes cartographic publishers. And he's like, frankly, between you and I, I don't care. He's like, all I care about is that the maps that show up in India have to be shown this way. But the maps that are outside India, he's like, I completely understand that they want to show ground truth. I understand that they have different depictions in mind. So, you know, it's kind of that, you know, the official statement versus the, you know, the kind of the private back back channel statement. But the, the answer is yes, there's there are countries that increasingly so because it, and with these every media story that happens about like showing like, oh my gosh, Apple changed their maps to show Crimea as part of Russia. Every time one of those stories happen, it actually alerts more and more governments to the fact that this is happening. And we're so we start Start seeing more and more pushback because they're like, we don't want this to happen. We want you to show our version and stop, you know, we stop doing this domain tailoring, um, which obviously that makes it even more complicated. Thanks. Do we have any more questions? I've got one. Um, I, uh, I'm quite a small fry, but I've experienced um, some conflict over putting Palestine on the map. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been told by a couple of um, employers not to put um, Palestine on the map. Yes. Um, and yeah, I I kind of picked up on your moral compass idea there <laughs> and felt I was very trapped because I wanted to go with what the UN said, but I also wanted to get paid. How do you <laughs> navigate those kind of situations? Um, that's, that's where basically, you know, the, the thing I love about my job is I get to talk to so many people from all sides of these issues. And so it's just, it's utterly fascinating. I'm, I'm a very curious person about all kinds of stuff. And so, uh, I love the fact that anything like this comes up, it gives me that opportunity to talk to all sides and kind of weigh, you know, I have to basically gather all the information possible, which is no different from when we're making a map, gather all possible sources. And you have to sort through this and say, okay, well, what are the goals that I have? Like, who is my client? What are they trying to achieve? And so it's this multi-layer of decision-making where I'm like, okay, for example, in the Palestine issue, it's like, okay, well, let's say the client, they, they want to do the right thing and they want to show it accurately. But then let's say, you know, 60% of their business in the Middle East is in Israel. You're going to have problems, you know, using Palestine in that case, especially if you're not different, if you're not making an Israeli only version or if, you know, you don't have a, a version in Hebrew, um, you know, then it's like, yeah, you've got a problem. So basically, I often find, try and find the middle ground. So, you know, for example, using Palestinian territories, that's a, that's a term that still I think can work, um, even though, yes, Palestine is something that I think most people would rather see, but Palestinian territories can technically still work as a as a as a accurate term. Um, it's just kind of like way back when when I was first dealing with the Dokdo Takashima issue between uh, the uh, Japan and Korea, and eventually what we did is initially we defaulted back to the the, the old you know colonial name. We said Lee and Court Rocks. And so when we, we chose Lee and Court Rocks, and so that really pissed off both Korea and Japan. And we said, well, that's our answer then. That's detente. They're both angry about it. So we found our solution. <laughs> and uh, that was until we found better technical solutions so we could actually, you know, tailor it for them. But at the time, that was that was a solution. It was basically find something that is marginally acceptable, just like when we did the Sea of Japan and then double labeled as EC. Korea didn't like the fact that we were subordinating their name under Sea of Japan, but we had all kinds of good valid reasons for doing so. Um, and they just basically accepted it. What they did is said, oh, you know what, the very fact that you're showing any, you know, uh, exonym there, that's good enough for us. And so they kind of backed off on the issue. So it, you did basically just have to find that creative solution the best you can. Wow, yeah, wow. I can't imagine doing something like that on a daily basis. <laughs> I love it, it's fun. <laughs> But it can, get, it, can, it can kind of split your brain every once in a yeah, while. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, no doubt. 